morphogenetic fields, the theory that lies behind the I Ching, all of these things are attempts to make a statement about the frontier of understanding. And to the degree that, in other words, it's like there's a perception which wants to be born, but it is, since it's at the edge of cognitive revelation, it's very hard to get it right. I mean, the I Ching, morphogenetic fields, the tarot, uh, the time wave that we looked at yesterday, these are all uh, attempts to encompass within a metaphor something which is at present almost unsayable. It's very interesting, if you care about this kind of thing, to go back uh, into the history of the evolution of ideas and see what it is like, what the ideological climate is like, right before an idea crystallizes and is finally gotten straight, or pretty straight. Uh, an area where that happened that I spent some time poking around in is um, immediate, you know, the 15 years preceding Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace's paper to the Royal Society in London, all of biology in England and Germany and on the continent, all of biology was intensely involved with what the literature of the time called the problem of the species. And, you know, they were, all these people were exploring various parts of the world, especially the tropics. They could see that if you go from one Indonesian island to another, there is shift of species. There are slightly modified forms. In other words, they had all the ingredients in front of them on the table, and people were trying to figure it out, but it w they didn't quite have it. And then it crystallized in the minds of certain people. For Alfred Russell Wallace, who is the real discoverer of natural selection, it, it sort of relates to our theory of creativity. He had malaria on the island of Ternate, north of um, the Moluccas, or in the North Moluccas. And in the fifth day of this intense malarial fever, he saw the solution to the problem of the species. And he, uh, he wrote it down in this fevered state. And then he worked his way through this illness. And when he came down and, and looked at what he'd written, he couldn't find fault with it. It seemed right. It's just a page and a half. It's preserved. It's all there. So he didn't know what exactly to do. So he decided he would write a letter to the greatest uh, naturalist, natural scientist of the age, who was uh, the aristocratic and well-connected Charles Darwin back in England. By this time, Wallace had been six years knocking around in the forests of Indonesia. So he sends this letter to Darwin. Darwin had been working on the origin of species for nearly 18 years. This letter arrives in the post. He opens it up and he just says, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, who is this guy? <laughs> Some surveyor from Wales has uh, beaten me to the punch, you know? And so he, he um, I don't suppose he got on the phone, but he sent a message with a servant to uh, Charles Lyell, who was his great friend and the, chair and the president of the Royal Society at that time, and said, you know, Charlie, this is a real problem. I'm bringing this book out. This guy, some clown, this guy looks like he scooped me. And Lyell said, don't worry, here's what we'll do will get him to deliver a paper at the Royal Society, and will have you deliver a paper the same evening. And you know how everybody adjourns to get drunk at the intermission, so we'll just schedule him after the intermission. <laughs> and this was done. 
And this is why Charles Darwin is the discoverer of evolution. For a few decades, it was called the Darwin-Wallace theory, but uh, eventually, it's an interesting story, although not relevant to what we're doing, but uh, what overturned, well, somewhat relevant, the reason, Dar the reason Wallace became persona non grata in English science was because he would not genuflect before pure reductionism. He said there is more to evolution than mutation and natural selection. There is a spiritual element, and that was all it took for him to get the boot, because 19th century scientific theory in biology was absolutely uh, phobic of deism, belief in God. They were really far more committed atheists than I would wager most of us are. It was a point of pride with them to squeeze spiritual assumptions out of all of their theories. There is no purpose recognized in, in Darwinian evolutionary theory. To speak of purpose in their minds was to completely misunderstand what was being suggested. And what they wanted was a theory of how life could evolve and come to be that would be specifically without purpose. Because the only kind of purpose they could imagine was God's plan. And they wanted to dump that whole idea. It was a very fierce intellectual struggle. As the inheritors of the victory, we don't really realize what a desperate struggle that was. I mean, as recently as 120 years ago, you could call yourself a member of the British intelligentsia, and you could believe that the Earth was created at 10 a.m. on September the 6th, uh, 2344 BC. That was educated Christian opinion in England as recently as 120 years ago. So we have made considerable intellectual progress, at least. They calculated, they read the Bible, all those begats, you know, and the ages of each person, so-and-so lived to be 120 years, and he begat so-and-so, and they added it all up, and that was the date. Well, yeah, they, uh, they had an incredibly limited view of the possibility of cosmic time. This is an intellectual revolution that has taken place almost within our lifetimes. Uh, people had no idea how old the world was and how old human beings were. I mean, that was as far as the imagination of Western Europe could be stretched to the idea that the Earth was 4,500 years old. You know, in the, at the turn of the century, when these French peasants were out digging truffles or feeding their goats or something, and they fell into the hole that led to the Lascaux paintings, and they saw all these, you know, the bison and the deer and these amazing paintings. Said, you know, this is really important. Let's get, let's tell the experts in Paris. So these, the great experts on on uh, the art of Europe came and down and lowered themselves into this cave and viewed all this stuff, and then announced to the Paris newspapers that. Uh, this stuff was not old, that in their expert opinion, these things had probably been done as a kind of uh, amusement by French soldiers in the Grand Army of Napoleon who overwintered there in 1812, you know? So they were saying it's basically less than 100 years old from their vantage point. These things were 20 to 25,000 years old. And as this dawned, this realization, this is the discovery of deep time. Uh, the idea that the, the Earth could be four billion years old, you know. These were astonishing intellectual revolutions of which we're the inheritors and we've 
sort of grown up with these assumptions, but they are very, very recent leaps in the evolution of the European uh, imagination. That's right. Oh, yeah. We're, we're a country of rattlesnake handling screwballs. Uh, I mean, it, every time I go to Europe, it amazes me the great difference between Europe and the United States is uh, that they, it's a secular society over there. You know, they have transcended fundamentalism pretty thoroughly. And, uh, and so discussions about social mores or drugs or stuff like that can go on without invoking concepts like God's wrath and Jesus' plan and stuff where you just, oy vey, you know. <clears throat> anyway, enough of Sunday morning raving.